Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and today we're talking about upcoming job training and professional development that is going to help people of our community enter maritime professions. We're talking about the Cultural Maritime Training Center that's being developed. And our guests today are Executive Director Pete Perez of 500 Sales and also uh, Director Marjorie Atalik Daria, the Cultural Maritime Training Center director as i said guys welcome to the show thank you thank you for having us so maybe start off with what is this center all about the cultural maritime training center it's a it's an initiative that's to build a maritime workforce in the cnmi and the intention here is to build on the cultural base so we looked at the situation with jobs with employment um which is all related to whether a community is thriving or not. And we're particularly concerned with the native population. And what we found is that a lot of our youth are leaving very early. Um, and what, what's happening is they're, they're, they're graduating from high school into a saturated job market. And they tend to look for how, what are they going to do with their lives. A lot of them are going to go off island. Forty-something percent of every graduate is going to go off island in the next year or so. So... Um, no, what, so what that means is we need jobs. We need jobs that are satisfying, that pay well, that allow someone to live where they want to live. And the surveys of, of high, graduating high school students have shown that they want to live here. They don't really want to leave. They want to live here. But to live here, they want the other things everybody wants. They want to raise a family. They want to have a nice things, a house. They want to send their kids to, to college. They want to travel. And for that, they need uh, jobs that are not just subsistence jobs. They need jobs that, that allow them to build a future. So we looked at their cultural, uh, at the cultural base here, which is islanders who have for millennia lived in the proximity of the water. Um, before the colonial period, this was a maritime community here in the Marianas. And when we're looking at the, at the uh, local people, meaning the Carolinians and the Chamorros, they come from societies that were developed around maritime traditions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> They're very good swimmers. They're, they love the water. They make great fishermen. It's like a natural fit for them. Then you look at the other people that are here now. Well, they're in a very similar situation. They're surrounded by water. And they're, they, they, they also need jobs. I mean, everybody's children, need, they need a job or they're not going to be able to stay here. So what we're trying to do is build, make, make the CNMI a maritime community again. And we, we're going to feed into the community a lot of trained people for maritime professions. And when we have that workforce, simultaneously, we're going to create the jobs with cooperation from a lot of partners and the, and the, and the school. So that's essentially what we're doing here. I love how you've, you've really humanized the big concept of professional development and really building an industry for the Marianas by starting with what is the need and the desire of the people and, and what industry can we build that will support that kind of lifestyle they want to have. Yeah, um, and that came from um, 500 Sales has been here, my, me and my wife Emma, who co-founded 500 Sales, we've been here for over eight years. And when we came here, our idea was to bring back the canoes, get people on the water again. But we really started to know this community, and we started to recognize that it's not enough just to build canoes and get people trained on sailing them. That's really, that's, that's just not enough to make this community whole again. And I mean whole again, talking about what happened since the, the colonial period where everything was disrupted and everything changed from a, from a community that was a communal in nature, where people shared their fish and they, they shared their agriculture crops and their labor and bread. It was a different kind of community, different kind of economy. And to switch to a jobs-based economy where you have to have a job to pay your rent and all that, um, that, that was a, a massive change. So, so we decided, well, we can't just bring back canoes. What we want to do really is get this community where it should be today if it hadn't been disrupted by the colonial period. 
And what would that look like? And what that would look like is we would have people on the water, as we always had. They would be making, a lot of them would be making their living off the water. They would be going out fishing because they enjoy it, even if it wasn't professional. They would be bringing fish home. They would probably be well represented in the uh, Coast Guard, in the Navy, which might change the way that those organizations look at local people. Um, they might, it might be more of a partnership and, and maybe a little bit less of, of just using our resources. But more, more um, I think that the, in that case what would happen is that the leadership of those organizations would recognize that they have partners in the local people who are competent and able and, particip and can participate and thrive. Marjorie, congratulations on recently becoming director of the center. I know we're still two years out from it opening, but um, what can we expect uh, as far as what the center is going to provide? Well, we can expect. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, well, we can expect that the Cultural Maritime Training Center will provide at least eight professional training tracks and a supplemental course on navigation. So uh, I think the thing that uh, like what Pete had mentioned, it really separates our CMTC facility from all other MTCs is that it's culturally grounded. You know, we offer a or we offer a training track on uh, traditional canoe fabrication and maintenance, and we're actually working with NMC's Community Development Institute with Director Maria Haberman on creating that curriculum. And Pete, as our senior boat builder over at boat builder, executive director. He's, he's hands-on and everything in, in our nonprofit, but uh, he's working on developing that curriculum with so Maria. So people can actually get a certification for that, correct? A certificate of completion, yeah. yes. And we're hoping that students can come out of that with an Associate of Applied Sciences as a culminating, as a culminant degree um, for that program. And NMCCDI would offer, like, of course, the general education requirements, but the core of the curriculum would be on traditional canoe fabrication, which would be developed in collaboration with Bob Ker per Bob Perkins from the MTC out based in Honolulu, Hawaii. From the what based in Hon Hawaii? From the Marine Education Training Center oh, with okay, Bob Perkins, okay. yes. Okay, great collaboration, way to bring the traditional culture in line, in, in partnership with, uh, of course, our need for certification and all those things that are required nowadays. Yeah, I was going to say that when um, it comes to the uh, to the M METC, that's the the Honolulu Community College partnership um, with the uh, boatyard, um, we are modeled after them. We're actually modeled after them. They're a success story. They're in Honolulu. The boatyard maintains the Hokulea. Students go there. They learn how to build boats uh, by industrial standards. Um, their their teachers are certified. Um, when when someone graduates from from graduates from the M METC they are able to get a job anywhere in the boat industry because they have a recognized credential. So we're following that, but we're trying to really be smart about this. If someone goes through our program, um, this is similar, again, following them. They will not only be certified in uh, by, I think it's the American Yacht Building Asso Builders Association, I'm not quite sure which it is, but they'll be, uh, they will have an industrial certification. They will have a certificate of completion from, in our case, um, um, uh, Northern Marianas College. Eventually, we hope to develop that into an AAS degree, um, and uh, they went, then we also have an apprenticeship program that we're that we're working again with the uh, with um, CDI, the uh, Community Development Institute for Northern Marianas College. So that uh, that would mean now they're apprentices, and they're going to anybody who wants to hire somebody to be a boat builder will know that people who come out of the of the CMTC have these multiple credentials and they'll be highly sought after. Marjorie, you mentioned eight components of this. I think that was just one we hit there. There is a lot going on there's here. A lot, yeah. Um, what, what other opportunities is the center going to provide? Well, there's also uh, the traditional sailing and voyaging track. So in the past, you know, we have some community programs with our Lalata classes and that's basically given our community a chance to learn how to sail our canoes that you see out there. So these, we have four 26-footers out in the Guma Sackman and a 15-footer as well. But yeah, uh, I think we've had four cohorts. We're about to go in our fifth by next month. And uh, it, it kind of really builds upon that. It's learning how to sail the canoes, not just how to sail it, but also how to put it upright. How do you rescue someone who uh, jumps overboard, not who falls overboard, you know? Uh, 
and as well as like we've done maybe four or five trips to Tinian at least. And I know we're thinking about having one in Rota for the Galita Festival in September. So a lot of that kind of builds upon what we hope we would get people to have some kind of credential that says they've completed a certain number of hours for sailing and voyaging and hopefully build upon that. And I think it would also lead into one of our Coast Guard tracks with a six-pack captain's license uh, uh, and operator of uninspected vessels so you can basically carry six passengers on your along with your crew on the canoes and be able to operate some kind of uh, tourist package under 500 sails where you'll be paid well and compensated well and you know be able to provide like this uh, cultural heritage of ours to not only to tourists but also one that we can be proud of and really empower people to own our 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 uh, our own our culture, culture yeah, and navigation yeah. so because this uh this sailing uh, that you're talking about it's based on traditional knowledge it's not necessarily using a gps or a map um or for this particular sailing that you're talking about do they have to learn like the star navigation uh, that's been passed down through the generation or is that a little bit different it's, I'd say it's a little bit different just because that falls under traditional navigation. We've actually okay. have some classes started already in the better part of this year. We are working with Master Navigator Cecilia Raikulipi, Master Navigator Mario Benito, and Master Navigator Antonio Pialog in conducting these courses. I believe Master Navigator Cecilia already opened his class to the community last month, so we've had about... 14 students who from the community who were interested in traditional navigation and wanted to learn more. Yeah, there, there's a huge interest in this community for traditional navigation, and there's a revival of cultural things. There's so much cultural dance, so much music, jewelry, all these things, and and we're we're playing into that. I mean, we're not playing into that. We're we're leveraging that. So again, that's the C in cultural maritime training center. Um, now, getting back to the um, the traditional canoe sailing and voyaging track um, these things these tracks that we have they they support each other for instance as as marjorie was saying we do teach the public how to sail a canoe but when they come into this track now you're going to have to sail it at a professional level which means you need to be really good at it and you're also going to have to take another track the ones that she mentioned for a six-pack captain's license because someone on that canoe taking passengers out for commercial gain you have to have a captain's license, and you have to have a sailing endorsement. But not only that, your crew, um, in addition to being competent, they need to be able to help uh, and deal with an emergency at sea. So they'll go into our other track. We have Red, uh, Red Cross certification for lifeguards, and we'll, we'll be able to get them courses. So they're, they're skilled first responders. And, and so these are, again, they're all they're kind of melted. It's, it's, I think it's pretty well thought out. That the, the cultural maritime training, yeah, yeah you, you get people trained in the multiple things that are going to make them a really good sailor. And again, building on our strengths in this community, I've never lived anywhere where the people are better hosts. People here know how to take care of out-of-town people. They know how to host them. They know how to make them laugh. And we, we know that when uh, when tourists leave here and they take the tourist surveys, that there are two things that they say. They say they want more um, exposure. Um, I mean, they want to experience more um, cultural-based activities. It's very important to them. They don't want to come here, honestly. They don't want to come here and watch Polynesian dancing. They want to come here and they want to see those those awesome Carolinian dances and the Chamorro dances that are that are, have been revived. And the second thing they say is they want to interact with the people. They want to know people. That's why they're here. They're 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 interested. And when you get them on a canoe sailed by local people, they get to talk on a wonderful setting, a very positive, interesting setting that's extremely cultural-based, and they get to know their crew. So it, it all goes together, and it, it helps the people who are, who are graduating and getting these credentials and going out in the, in the community in their maritime professions. They're going to have a lot of satisfaction because it's culturally relevant, it's what they do well, it pays well, and they're appreciated. And then you look on the other side, the visitors who come here, where else in the world can they go and get a ride on a traditional canoe? Where, where, where are communities um, geared up to take them, to take them out and show them this? No one's really doing that. You can't go to Hawaii and take a ride on the Hokulea. No, you can't do that. But Saipan and the CNMI and hopefully the Mariana Islands too will become known as a place 
where you can go and experience real tradition, real culture, and ride and experience riding on a traditional sailing proa. We're talking today about the Cultural Maritime Training Center, and we'll be back with more after this break. In Northern Marianas Humanities Council, Bula Guinahanya Puri Historian Marianas Zan Kutura, Sinyon Soda SCCN and Futmashon Gi's on Mami website, nmhcouncil.org, Pat Besita Gi YouTube, Pat Facebook, Guajaloc with Diferentes Class in Le Blue Senior on Farm. In Northern Marianas Humanities Council, Azuzura Todu e Experiencia Tauta. Welcome back to your Humanities Half Hour. We are talking again about the Cultural Maritime Center with uh, Executive Director Pete Perez of, of 500 Sales and Marjorie Atzaleg Daria, Director of the Center. Um, Pete, this is not just, or, or Marjorie, this is not just a vision for the Marianas. You guys are thinking beyond the Marianas. And we got to mention our partners. Uh, I don't know which one you want to start off with because both, I mean, everything is so well thought out here, it seems. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we we are not here doing this by ourselves. It's, it's not, not possible. Um, for one thing, it costs money to, to have a boatyard, to operate a boatyard, to operate a canoe house, to pay the teachers. To, and, and so the financial part requires partners, and we're very, very lucky because early on, we were allowed to use the old procurement warehouse. Uh, Richard Simmons, who was the uh, Secretary of Department of Lands and Natural Resources, uh, they were taking care of it after it was pretty much flooded and very heavily damaged after Sotolor and YouTube. Typhoon Sotolor. Yeah, Sotolor was the one that did it, and did it in. But he said, yeah, just go ahead. You need a place to build canoes. There's a uh, forklift. Just clear some area, and, and you can use it. And that's how we got started building canoes. So when we fast forward to where we are today, we have the entire warehouse and we need every square inch of it. Uh, half of it right now is under use by us and the other half is, uh, is being used by uh, um, the CUC. Um, they've got another three years and then they'll have their own warehouse and they'll move their stuff out. But um, it is an excellent place for a boatyard and a training facility. It's roomy enough. It's zoned in the right place for light industrial. It's next to two boat ramps so we can get right out on the water. And um, to make this thing sustainable, we needed to keep that cost down. And so today we are under a memorandum of understanding with the uh, Office of the Governor's D um, Indigenous Affairs Office where we have use of that building for 20 years and also the Gumasakman, the, the canoe house in Susupi, also 20 years. So they're our partner, and you can imagine how much it would cost us to rent or build buildings, buy the real estate and all that. We could not do it without this support. But having the support is not only that we can do it, our overhead is very low. We're just worrying about our CUC bill right now, that as far as the facilities go, and we have plans to put solar on that roof so we can take care of that. We gotta keep the cost way, way down so we can focus on cranking out a lot of new, newly trained people for this emerging maritime workforce. So they're big partners, Office of the Governor and the Indigenous Affairs Office. Um, our internet, we have IT&E has, has been paying, uh, I mean, allowing us uh, have to have free internet and phones. That's huge because these are monthly costs and these are the things that, that stop you from putting your time and energy into your programs. So that's that's really great. Um, the, uh, the other partners are the college because the college is able to supplement the training with uh, courses that we are ne not necessarily the best to, um, to teach because if you do go for an AA degree, an AAS degree, Associate of Applied Sciences, that's a degree where you're going to have some a lot of courses, basic courses that we don't teach. They're not about boat building. They're not about sailing. They're about math. They're about writing, those, those kinds of things. So for sustainability, to have them as a partner is huge. It, it ties into the workforce through CDI, the Community Development Institute. And then you go further and realize we share this goal with Northern Marianas College of being a regional resource so that people in the Caroline Islands and in, even in Polynesia, they can send their students to go to uh, Northern Marianas College and go through our programs and go back educated and trained with skills that are extremely relevant where they live. And we know there's a lot of problems right now with, the, with climate change, with rising sea levels, with population. Um, the Caroline Islands are in crisis. There's a lot of low-lying atolls that are losing their arable land and, 
And so they need solutions, too. So they're going to be able to come in here and build their own canoes with traditional materials like wood or um, with modern materials like fiberglass. And that's going to get them through this so they don't lose their ability to sail and their access to their fisheries and their transportation while we solve, the world solves all these big problems of climate change. And, um, and we can get the, we can even work on it as, as a, I think there's, there's help for, for um, Oceania in trying to find ways to get wood because that's really important because climate change is ruining the production of wood that's used for boats. That takes time to solve, too. So we see ourselves as having a very important role, not only in helping with people's lives right now, helping them thrive, but also with dealing with these long-term problems and giving them time to continue their cultural life on the water, in canoes, until we can solve all these problems of rising sea level and, and losing land. Marjorie, you you are the director. I understand we have about like two years before the center opens. What's going to be happening or what needs to happen between now and then? And I think we missed some of the, the eight tracks. I think we only got to like three of the tracks. Give us the tracks and then uh, tell us where we're heading uh, now to make that m- make this a uh, success. Okay, just to recap really quickly, we have uh, our traditional navigation, which is a supplemental course, so there is no, just to be clear, there is no degree conferred upon that or completion, just because we want to stick to, like, a cultural basis that, you know, that would be deemed upon by the by our Carolinian navigators slash instructors. So in addition to that, we offer c- traditional canoe fabrication and maintenance, there's also traditional sailing and voyaging, and then our Coast Guard tracks would include the standards of training and certification and watch keeping. Which now, what is watch keeping? So uh, last I checked, it was basically like uh, operational duties on a vessel. Ah, oh, so, keeping watch. Yes. Yeah, so, I gotcha. Uh, keeping watch. It's also learning rescue techniques. You know, how do you put out fires, being certified in first aid and CPR on a boat, being able to understand. Like these are international standards for uh anyone who's working on a Coast Guard certified vessel on, you know, what are the do's and don'ts on on that. So it's it's a really basic, it's a five-day course completion based on what I last saw. So there's still a lot of work we're still going to be tapping into with Coast Guard credentials um, and our Coast Guard training tracks just because we've, um, we ran into some hiccups on establishing that, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to get that on firmer ground before our first year is over. So in addition to SDCW, we have our operator of uninspected vessels. So it's basically the six-pack captain's license, right? And then we have our merchant mariner's credential and our able-bodied seamen. So all of these, again, are on being able to operate on a vessel, being able to crew a a canoe or a ship, right? (laughs) You mentioned merchant marines, uh, as I recall through some conversations I've had. That's a a very well-paying profession, correct? Mm -hmm. And so you're saying that people could be certified to become a merchant marine through this program. That's incredible. It is. I know it's going to take some while. I think of like even yeah. for an able-bodied seaman, you'd have to have at least two years of sailing experience under your belt before you would qualify. Yeah, and like you said, it, it's very high paying. Most of these jobs, once you get on a ship, they pay well. But the merchant marines is one I'm familiar with because my grandfather was a, a merchant mariner. And he'd go on these trips, and we wouldn't see him for a month or two. But when he came back, he was loaded. I, I don't mean he was drunk. He was. <laughs> he just was loaded with money. You could just hear it jing- you know, jingling in his pockets when he walked. And, and they were good times when he came back. So that, again, is a job, a profession that's very compatible with the people here who, are, who live around the water, who love the water and have for, for so many generations. There are people here are happy on the water. He can go out. He can have adventures or she can have adventures. They can come home and they have everything they need to pay all their bills, pay for their house, pay for their kids' education. It's a really good option for people living on islands to be able to get access to that kind of money just by going to sea and coming back. This is one of the few jobs offered where you don't need a college degree to attain a six-figure salary, you know? So I think it's, it's I mean, when you think of the, well, I think about my, my the way I was brought up, you know, and how you needed to go off island to get a degree, otherwise you won't be considered successful. You got to be able to speak English really well, you know. And I think back that there wasn't enough emphasis and other options. And when I went off to the states, I was in classes with students from Europe who start were starting college at like 26 because they traveled the world and probably worked for a little while before they decided college was 
for them. And, you know, college isn't uh, everyone. Fit. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I just really like what our organization is doing is providing an avenue that's culturally tailored and speaks back to their cultural roots and merging that with modern innovation right now. So. I want to thank you both for sharing uh, today and I think really uh, getting people excited maybe that really didn't understand the breadth of what this center is going to offer. Any final thoughts before we go? Marjorie? I want to tie it back to cultural health. You know, when we think about health, we think about social, emotional, physical, right? But I found that a missing component of health, because I uh, used to work at CHCC, was uh, the emphasis on cultural health and how that and how a strength in cultural identity really promotes a resiliency in our people and it's something that needs to be emphasized a lot more and um, just uh, embedded into our society and to maintain that and to hold on to it. Yeah, I, I think that I 100% agree um, with that sentiment. You know, the people here are proud of their culture, and they should be. They should be proud of their history, that they were able to survive on these, these islands so far from all these other resources. And they built, like, the world's fastest boats out of vegetation, you know? They didn't have any iron. Everything that they, they built, it was, it was from their minds. It was from their, you know, the fact that they were clever. They figured out how to navigate. They figured out how to survive and build boats and travel thousands of miles. And anyway, it, it is so deeply rooted in, in the way that, that in, our, in culture here and, and the way that we support each other. Because voyaging is about support, it's about preparation of the boats, of the food, of, of mental preparation. You have the support of your family and you go out and you, you, you travel in a dangerous situation where you may not come back. But um, I think a lot of the extended family traditions, the way that we value that, the way we value um, you know, just our community, that's coming from canoe culture. And we maybe stopped recognizing it when we were denied access to the water by from the Spanish times, but it's there. And when you when you become aware of it, you start to see it, and you recognize you've been practicing canoe culture in your family. So it's really great that that way. For us at 500 Sales, you know, our goal, our mission is really to create a, to to enable a, a thriving native community that successfully integrated. Their tra our traditions into modern life. And this is going to enable us to do that. And I, I just want to remind the community that it takes time. This is a multi-year project. There's a lot of moving parts. We're developing the curriculum. In, a, in two or three years from now, we'll have all our tracks productive and people will be able to make their choices from these tracks. But right now we've got some tracks going and we're going to keep developing them. So watch the news. Watch 500 Sales Facebook page. Um, we will put, and Instagram, and, and our website, we're going to try to make that a little better because we can put some level of information there that doesn't really work on Facebook. But just, just be patient and know that, that we're working hard with a lot of partners, and, and we're going to turn this community back into a maritime community. So just watch for your opportunities. And join the sale. <laughs> yeah, learn to sail, learn to swim. Thank you both, uh, not only for your time today and for sharing, but for the important work that you're doing on behalf of our community. Thanks for having us. Our guests today have been Executive Dir uh, Director Pete Perez of 500 Sales and Director Marjorie Atle Daria of the Cultural Maritime Training Center. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. Your Humanities Half Hour is a production of the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, funded in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council.